Hello there, good people of the realm. Today we're going to take a pretty grim and macabre turn into the bizarre and fascinating world of serial killers and their art. I know, solid subject for a first video. So, when it comes to art and serial killers, what better place to start than John Wayne Gacy? Now, obviously. Obviously. This video is coming with somewhat of a trigger warning because I'm going to be discussing some pretty bleak subject matter and some pretty disturbing acts inclusive of his crimes and how they occurred. And I'm doing this in order to try and get you to know who this person is so we can further look at his art and analyze that a little bit more deeply and see what we can draw from it. So please keep that in mind that some of the subject matter in this video might not be for you necessarily. A point that you hear discussed a lot when it comes to art, music, film, books, any sort of medium, can you separate the art from the artist? Now, this question unto itself deserves an entire episode, which I should probably do. But for the sake of this video, let's say... not really? As an artist, the things you create are inherently an expression of you. No matter how little you think it is or how banal you think the art is, even if it's a song about getting f***ed up at the club, it's still an expression of you, your wants, your desires, and your views on things. And I would say this is especially the case when you're looking at someone like a John Wayne Gacy, who did what he did, we really don't have a choice but to look at his art through the lens of the gravity of his acts. These acts consumed him, they were who he was at his core, and they were the defining features of his life. So, if you're a uh, nice, normal person who doesn't frequently stare into the abyssal darkness, like me, and don't know about the life and crimes of John Wayne Gacy, let me ruin your day. I'll try to be brief with this. John Wayne Gacy was an extremely prolific American serial killer active during the 70s, who assaulted, raped and tortured and eventually murdered at least 33 young men and boys, <sighs> and then proceeded to bury them in his crawl space. Well, he got 24 buried in the crawl space of his house, and then ran out of space. Gacy would mostly use strangulation as his method of murder and he would do it via something he really childishly called the rope trick, in which he would create a rope noose and tighten it with the handle of a hammer. John wore the mask of a regular citizen pretty well by a lot of accounts. He was involved in the community heavily in terms of local politics, very avid member of the JCs. He managed a chain of KFCs and had a pretty successful contracting business by some, shall we say, 70s standards, a bit of a laugh with the boys, showing stag films and that's a lot to unpack 70s boys being boys unto its own, but that's for another time. And most notably, he dressed up as Pogo the Clown, pretty terrifying in its own right, but barely, barely under the surface of this there was a raging river of inner turmoil and darkness that just loomed. He struggled pretty severely with his own sexuality and a really, really mean and repressive idea of what masculinity was, most likely instilled by his father. Gacy proceeded to become slightly effeminate and close to his mother, his father would try to beat that out of him, beating him for being sensitive in any which way and form. So you're kind of dealing with a pretty extreme recipe for creating someone who's going to need to exert power later in life in a pretty dark and cruel way. Now after a several year span of sexual assaults and murders, Gacy in 78 was eventually arrested, brought to trial for his crimes, and sentenced to the death penalty. And in 1994 he was executed. But all the while, John painted before and after, mostly after, his incarceration. And that's kind of what we're here today to have a look at. Is there something we can draw from his art? Is there something we can analyze about someone who sat at the extreme end of human behavior? These days, his paintings could go for some fairly exorbitant prices, according to The Observer, reaching anywhere from 6,000 to 175,000 at times. But now to actually look at his paintings, he painted in a very, very simple, block-colored style that looks childish at first, 
But then when you go through the catalogue of his work, you can actually see that he has an understanding of form, how to present things, which really leads me to the thought, how purposeful was the childishness within his paintings? Was that something he chose to do, or was that something he just gravitated to? Now, why would this be? Why would someone who has committed such horrendous acts be presenting this childlike, innocent art to the world. There's a lot to kind of be unpacked there. Is this art intended for children? Is it intended to be looked upon in that way? Or is this some sort of uh, aim to reclaim a childhood that he thinks he didn't have? Is it some sort of expression? Is he stuck in childhood? Did his father, so to speak, stagnate his childhood when he tried to beat the man into him? Thus leading to him being kind of obsessed with childlike imagery. One of the themes that is highly recurring in his art is the seven dwarves. From an artist's point of view, it could be that Gacy is kind of aiming to subvert expectations by mixing the weight of his acts, the horror of his acts, with this childlike imagery. Clowns were still kind of innocent at the time, until Gacy. This can kind of be compared to the way that, like in a horror film, a doll can be terrifying. Now, boom, that explains why the light changes colour. Now, if you've been looking at his art, you may have noticed, shall we say, a reoccurring theme, and you might be asking yourself the question, why so many f***ing clowns? As most people know, art can be an extremely personal and very intimate way to analyse, understand, and express yourself. Inclusive of exploring your own identity and presenting your own identity, it's a great way to put yourself on paper and then look back at it. And that goes for music, novelization, any sort of art. And so obviously, given that we know he frequently dressed as a clown, I can't help but think that his obsession with painting clowns came from some sort of angle of self-analysis and self-presentation. Pogo the Clown is really the undying image we're left with from Gacy. It's kind of the visual tombstone that he's left us. And so I really believe that Pogo the Clown kind of became this strange sort of alter ego, kind of like an eternal scapegoat. There have been little cards that he has sent through to people who have bought his art in which it just says, a clown can get away with murder. So this leads me to a few other thoughts. Whilst painting clowns, John could have been exploring a side of him that was only ever seen by people who he was about to kill, this vicious monster within. But now, after his arrest and incarceration, the entire world knew who and what he was at his core. And so maybe he's now taken that chance of being exposed to kind of put that monstrosity onto canvas and despite whether people wanted it or not trying to share it with the world. There's an experience that must be very unique to serial killers in which you've led this life of extreme secrecy where your acts, your deepest desire, your core identity has had to be kept from everyone. And then all of a sudden you go from completely within the shadows to being the most exposed, analysed person on the earth at that point in time. And yes, of course, there are some celebrities that are watched with an extremely harsh light and judged for their smallest actions and their smallest words. But there is no one coming to the defence of someone like a Gacy. There is no PR team that can spin this. They are stripped bare for all to see and so they go from one extreme to the other. From what I've seen, many serial killers kind of find a huge amount of solace in the exposure. They finally can be who they are in the public eye and feel this kind of odd relief. And so within his art, I dare say there's a huge element of that newfound freedom. Another angle. I don't like yellow. Boom. Another way to look at this more simply, John Wayne Gacy was a drastic sociopath. Obviously. 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 And with that comes a pretty large side order of narcissism and self-obsession and self-importance. And so the plain and simple way to look at this is that the clown in all forms of his art is just him. Him flexing, showing off, and most importantly, putting himself back in the limelight. He's making himself the star of that little world again, which kind of goes hand in hand with psychopathy and narcissism. And there are two points that really lead me to believe this is the case, it being that in the vast majority of all the art I've seen of him, the clowns are painted in this extremely charming, kind, protagonist way. They are beings to be the centre of this world. They are the good guys. And the second part that leads me to believe this is that the most heavily featured out of the, all, all the clowns is, of course, Pogo. And furthermore, whenever he depicts Pogo, Pogo is shown as being friendly in appearance, little wave, cheeky smile. In form, he's extremely domineering. He tends to be standing always taller than the perspective, taller looming over the viewer of the painting, and larger than all the other 
figures in the painting, not just in size or height, but in threatening presence. He always puts himself as this kind of ghostly, ominous feature. I mentioned the height angle because it's just an interesting thing that you might think, well, maybe John Wayne Gacy was a larger guy and that's how he sees himself in his mind's eye. But in terms of height, he was an average man. He was 5'9". And so I can't help but thinking that this is another way that he sees himself as when he's Pogo the Clown, he's this larger than life, violent hero that he kind of could assume he was. More so, through these images, Gacy sows himself to the cultural idea of clowns. It really can lead him to further degrade what a clown means to society. This is the era of going to the circus as an entertainment thing. This is when clowns were viewed as something for children. According to some, Gacy's arrest in 1978 was a real turning point for the identity of a clown. It was only a few years after that that Stephen King's novel It came out, and I would have to assume that there was influence. Gacy was enormous headline news, the killer clown. And the reason I think that Gacy sewing himself to the identity of a clown and sewing himself to the cultural image of a clown is intentional. Sociopaths, serial killers, can be extremely hooked on power. Killing to a lot of them is the ultimate exertion of power. They get to exert that power of choice. They get to take someone's life away and that is the ultimate power that they get to experience. But you can look at examples like the Zodiac Killer, as opposed to killing more and more people, diverted back into writing basically threatening letters to the police and and the news and holding a city hostage with threats and that can be extremely powerful and so I can't help but think that Gacy found a lot of power within the idea of deforming and perverting the idea of this childlike innocent symbol basically getting off on the idea that in the future people are going to associate clowns with something really horrific with basically him. This definitely could have been a way of him exerting his force from behind bars. So moving on from the image of clowns, there's a set of paintings that Gacy does that depict other serial killers and these fascinate me. We really view serial killers as a dangerous, monstrous set of creatures, which is a fair assumption to make. But Gacy's paintings of, say, Charles Manson, Ed Gein, have a bizarre and very specific kind of sensitivity to them. This odd kind of vulnerability. Uh, as an example, when you see his painting of, say, Charles Manson, he looks tired, sad, in a real human way. He's exhausted, he's just done. As opposed to a, the common depiction of Charles Manson, which is just a wild-eyed madman spouting absurdity throughout the land. And especially Ed Gein's painting, it's painted in this really somber, eyes closed, worried and regretful moment. I have to believe he's painted these subjects in this way because of some form of identification with these other killers. As someone else who is seen in the same light by the world, and to further go back and grab from the narcissistic angle, it's not as if he's painting a local gang member, he's painting murderous icons and I have to assume that he views himself in that stratus. As a fun little side note, whatever fun means in the context of this video, the way in which he portrays Ted Bundy makes me giggle a little because it's very comical. Apparently, Gacy held, shall we say, no love for Bundy. This is because they were contemporaries, they both were arrested in the same year, they were both the big figures of American serial killers during the 70s and I can't help but think Gacy was looking at Bundy saying that guy is gonna steal some of my thunder I can't make him a big strong figure or I can't make him sympathetic he's got to be made fun of time for purple so while researching this video it became increasingly difficult to compile a significant amount of images of his work and even more difficult to compile a chronological history of his work. This is because as his execution loomed, the victims' families would purchase as much of his art as they possibly could in order to burn it on the night of the execution. Now this is a, shall we say, fairly legitimate way of expressing the intense and horrific emotions that you must be feeling. Though I can't help but look at this and say I would love to have seen a really cohesive collection of his work, especially leading up to his execution to know exactly what he was feeling as someone on death row. Because as pretentious as this sounds, clearly I'm 
very f***ing pretentious. It's easier to lie through words than I think it is to lie through image. I think that when people put an art form down, when they put music down, when they put paint to canvas, when they put image to film, I think that there's a doorway into a truer understanding of what someone is going through. And does that mean you have to sympathise with him? No! F no! But I do believe that there's a definite benefit to understanding why these things can happen how they can happen. Now I know some people may look at these paintings that are somewhat rudimentary or as we said before can be a bit childish and say well there's not too much to analyze from there it's just some paintings to pass the time when he was in prison but no art develops in a bubble. It's impossible to look at art without the context of the artist, without the context of the world that they're in, without the context of the situation they're in. And so when you're looking at someone that is sitting on such an extreme side of humanity there is a wealth of things to analyze. But if you have a macabre mind and a curious manner, I highly recommend looking into more of his art. Thank you everyone for watching and of course, you know, the good old call to arms of like, share, subscribe and do all the things that make me forget that my city is in stage four lockdown because of corona rabies and that I am connected to society in this world and not sitting here at ridiculous times of the evening researching serial killers paintings. If you have any suggestions of movies, themes, art, video games that you'd like me to look at, leave a little comment below and uh, maybe I'll get to it. Maybe I won't give a shit.